Um, our next talk is from Pia Eichinger, who is a master's student at the University of Berg with a research interest in using quanti quantitative software engineering methodology on the Linux kernel. Um, she will be presenting on, so you're a Linux kernel developer, name all the subsystems. Please welcome Pia. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. So again, my name is Pia Eichinger. I am a student at the University of Applied Sciences in Regensburg in Germany. And there really isn't that much to say about me yet since I'm really still a student and I'm still at the very start of my career, but my research interests includes the uh, organizational and maintenance structure of the Linux kernel, which is ultimately the topic of this talk. So just a quick introduction to the people who made this all possible, um, our collaborators. So we have Ralf Ramsauer, Stefanie Schert, and Wolfgang Maurer. Uh, Ralf Ramsauer, the PhD student, he developed and maintains most of the tools that provide the very foundation of all these findings that I will now present. And just a quick introduction to what really drives us to our motivation and goals. So what we want to do is to formalize and assess the Linux kernel development process. And by doing that, we sort of hope to gain some sort of deeper understanding about how it all works. And at the end of the day, if we have that understanding, we want to sort of support and enhance it. And we're providing and developing tools to support the open source community. Like we're using Linux, the Linux kernel is a prime example for that. But anybody who uses a open source development process or it's just Git for that matter could use our uh, tools. And the things that we develop are especially interesting to assist and support safety critical developments. So I'll get to that later. Our collaboration partners include Eliza from the Linux Foundation. Um, you may or may not have heard that name before. This is a project to enable Linux and safety critical environments and the University of Passau. And I am going to be talking a lot about uh, safety critical environments and safety critical certification. So just a quick introduction to what the entire idea is behind that. So it's needless to say that safety critical environments are highly sensitive environments. And in very, very extreme case scenarios, you like having software that works and having software that works the way it's intended to work could ensure the difference between survival and death. And what safety critical certification aims to achieve is to try to ensure software quality by all means necessary. And one idea to sort of achieve that is to look at the development process and correlate that to the quality of the software. So the underlying assumption here is that the development process can impact the quality of the software. If you have a really, really good development process, well-defined and everything, and like every single patch needs to be discussed, every single feature reviewed, stuff like that, and the developers strictly comply by this process, the idea is how bad can the end product be at the end of the day. So that's obviously uh, subject to, to uh, discussion, but still um, this is the assumption that this certification is based upon. And if you can prove that your developers strictly comply by this process, and if you can prove to what degree, because there will always be irregularities, right? You achieve, um, a, you, can, you can get a uh, certification for safety critical environments and you're one step further to enabling your software there. And now, if we try to introduce Linux to safety critical environments, we run into some major certification challenges because of its open development process. So the thing about Linux open source development process is that the broad opinion is that it's very well defined and it's really good and it produces some really good and quality code, but nobody really cares to properly document perfectly everything that's happened and everything and how it was reviewed and stuff like that with the goal in mind to then later use that to prove that certain criteria for the certification were actually met. So the idea behind that is all this data is public and with a little bit of data mining, we could have an ex post fact analysis after it already happened and characterize the entire process um, with, with hindsight. And just a second, um, characterize the entire process with hindsight and use statistical methods to research and understand the development process. And the thing that we are really interested in is, is patch integration specifically. So um, 
the things that I'm asking myself is who integrates a patch and, and how exactly does a patch end up in mainline? Like this is the sort of stuff that we're discussing. And I am sure that you're probably very familiar with the concept of the maintainers hierarchy, right? So there are developers who develop patches and they send them to file maintainers and then to subsystem maintainers like pull requests and at the end of the day it somehow ends up in mainline all the way up there. So this is like a uh, common concept um, that, that people refer to and stuff like that. And we really wanted to get to know this thing. So um, originally, we wanted to know about two things in particular. So first of all, the conforming integration of patches. Um, this will not be the topic of this talk. This is something we, um, we worked on, but it will not be the prime topic of this talk, but do keep it in mind for later because I'll get back to that. So conforming integration of patches just basically means if you have a patch, just look at the affected files and um, look at getmaintainer.pl or uh, the maintainer's file and just who is the relevant maintainer for this particular patch or who are the relevant maintainers. And if one of these maintainers integrates that patch, like a relevant maintainer, we will call that patch conformingly integrated. So that's just one classification and we wanted to sort of analyze that. And also we wanted to analyze the patch traversal through the maintainer's hierarchy. So uh, there's this thing called the maintainer's hierarchy and it's supposedly well defined. And we have a patch that goes all the way up here and we really wanted to know how it ends up in, in, in mainline at the end of the day. So uh, what we wanted to know is the, like any, any cross-cutting patches and, and pull requests going on, like for example, this patch uh, going straight up here and then maybe down to the file maintainer down there and then straight into mainline, or is it all like compliant with the defined maintainer's hierarchy? And we were all good to go. And this, these were the projects that we defined and really wanted to work on. And I remember it so well. I walked up to my supervisor and I asked him, okay, I'm so ready to start this. I'm so enthusiastic. Where can I find this maintainer's hierarchy and, and where can I start analyzing it and comparing um, the, the patch data to the actual maintainer's hierarchy? And that's where it all begins. So the problem is there is no clear-cut definition of the maintainer's hierarchy. And this is where all these questions and, and stuff started. So we did a little bit of brainstorming and we thought, okay, so there's supposedly this thing like subsystem maintainers, but actually where can I find a documentation on all subsystems? And one question led to another and you find yourself thinking, what exactly is a subsystem even? And thus the name of this talk, this may seem like a really, really trivial question, but I do invite you to pause and ponder for a second on this because um, if I were to ask you right now, what exactly is a subsystem? What would you tell me? And I am ma just making assumptions here, but I'm probably thinking you'd say something like, well, that's easy. So there's the thing called the maintainer's fault. I right? just look it up there. And you would not be the only one with that opinion. So. In documentation for early stage planning, it's stated that, again, the maintainer's file is the place to start, but not all subsystems are represented there. So it's not directly stated, but it's mentioned as if um, like the singular entries and maintainers are standalone subsystems. Like all of these entries are real standalone subsystems, which then again means that there are over 2000 of them, but Right, who am I to judge? Problem solved, we know what subsystems are. Well, only thing is, if you look a little bit deeper and search for the term um, subsystem in official documentation, you may stumble across something like this. So basically, contains usage, usage information about media subsystem and stuff about media subsystem. So obviously there's this thing called the media subsystem and apparently maintainers is the place to start. So if you go up to maintainers and look it up, you will not find a single media or media subsystem entry in maintainers. Rather, there are over 100 subsystems, subsystems containing the word media, which then raises the question, which one is it? And if I were to ask you which one of these standalone subsystems is the media subsystem that is mentioned here, 
pick any one of them and tell me which one's the one that's being like that is <laughs> that is being talked about. Sorry, um, and I'm again just making assumptions, but. I think you tell me something like, no, it's not any singular one of them. It's like probably the summary of them. And I might be nitpicky here, but these are sort of contradicting usages of the term subsystem. And there is no clear cut definition. Like, is it in maintainers? Is it not in maintainers? What exactly is it? And we can't really work with that. We need a clear and well defined definition of, um, of the term subsystem. So. We just went ahead and did that for ourselves and just thought about what would be the most intuitive way to think about subsystem. And we defined the term. So spoiler alert, the entries and maintainers are not subsystems. We will call them sections from now on. And sections can intersect. So there can be files that belong in two sections at once, which we will measure in lines of code. And if they do, we will call them thematically related. And a grouping of thematically strong related sections will be then called a subsystem. So like the grouping of thematically strong related media sections will be the media subsystem. And I hope you do agree with us on that. Like this is probably a very intuitive way to think about the term subsystem. Like it has something to do with maintainers, but um, still it's more like a grouping based on thematically relations. So this sort of work can be so exciting, but so unpredictable at the same time. So we stumbled into a problem that we just did not think would be a problem prior to starting. There is no clear listing of subsystems, but why not find out ourselves? We have our definition now. And we still wanted to look at conforming integration of patches, so do keep that in mind. Um, like, was a patch integrated by a relevant maintainer? Yes or no. Conforming? Yes or no. And now let's just apply our term for a subsystem detection and really see what we can find and really try to um, apply that. And just a very, very quick notch to just very quick interjection to a, in a very recent article. So there's very, very recently, there's been this article by Jonathan Corbett, quick intersection. It's called Maintainers Truth and Fiction. And it's like analyzing the maintainers file. And the basic gist of it is to analyze the maintainers file and look for any sort of um, inconsistencies and, and stuff like that. So the maintainers file is still a file that um, needs to be maintained. But there are still st like weird stuff in there like um, maintainers, no, like sections that don't have any maintainers and stuff like that. And that was just the basic gist of this article, like analyzing maintainers and looking for inconsistencies. And what we are doing exactly is also analyzing maintainers, but like looking at a completely different topic. We're analyzing maintainers and trying to sort of um, compare it to reality, like how exactly are patches integrated when looking at maintainers and when comparing it to relevant maintainers. And if you analyze it and compare it to the Linux kernel repository and base it on, on like shared files and stuff like that, what sort of structure could you find? Like what sort of subsystems could you find? So we're both sort of analyzing maintainers, but two different aspects of it. I'm just, if you've read it or not, it's a really good read. So maybe do go back after this talk and read it. But I just wanted to, um, quickly notch that article because it was just so recent and so unexpected that this this project was also going on. But not to get off track here, our goal is still to like find and analyze subsystems. And what how we wanted to achieve that was to like try to visualize the maintainer sections based on thematical relations and sort of see what we can find there. And the thing about visualizing stuff and visualizing relations between things is that it's probably a good idea to start with graphs of the sort because graphs are like a good way to visualize that sort of stuff. So let's define the section graph. The section graph is an undirected graph and the idea is to have the sections of maintainers become the vertices and um, they can share edges if they share any lines of code. So if there are any files that belong in two sections at once, these two sections will share an edge in the section graph. And then we can just apply common clustering detection algorithms such as walk trap to detect any clusters or communities, um, which we will we'll then define as subsystems. And that's just the underlying idea. And just to uh, 
get a quick idea for that. Imagine you have like three sections, A, B, and C, and they intersect in some way. So A, B, and C affect files in some way, and A is very large, and it strongly intersects with B and C, and B and C are disjoint. You'd have a section graph like this. Okay, so A shares edges with C and B. A very, very simple idea of the, like trying to visualize sections and maintainers. So that's the section graph, and this is it. This is the top 20% section graph. So it turns out that after all, maybe visualizing over 2,000 sections in maintainers was a bit ambitious and out of scope for the project that I did. So we had to like cut it down on the largest 20% on the 20% largest sections within the maintainers file and just see what we could find there. And that's the result. So just let that sink in for a moment. This is a visual representation of the maintainers file and its thematic relations based on, on the um, subsystem definition that we provided. So this is what it looks like. And this is all very pretty and nice to look at, but what we really wanted to do was actually detect subsystems, and this is not really of any use if we don't actually know what's inside of these clusters that we defined as subsystems. So what we're going to do now is have a little cluster discussion. And the basic idea is to just take some of the major clusters and isolate them as an own graph and then recluster them again from within to detect any sort of substructures within subsystems. And we will later see why that's a good idea or sometimes a good idea. So just imagine you're taking any one of these major clusters. So we're going to take the one down here first and just cut off all the edges to the outside, delete all the other vertices and then just look at it as a complete isolated graph. Not only do that, but also recluster it again from within to see what sort of like structure you could find from within. So that's what we're going to do now, and that's what you're going to see here in a second. So I am just opening a PDF file here, and this is it. Just going to zoom out for a second to get a basic idea of it. So this is the cluster that I just showed you, isolated as an own graph and clustered from like again from within. And just to get a little look at um, the stuff that's going on here. So I hope you can read it. Um, there's this very backbone-like section going on here that's called Networking General. And if you look at some of these names in here, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, you're going to see a lot of networking stuff going on here. So there's networking, IP security, networking, TCP, um, Lots of networking stuff going on here, and I'm just, I'm just saying this is a clear ongoing theme in here of like networking-related sections. So um, it's not that far-fetched to say this is the networking cluster, and uh, it spans up this like it has this backbone section. It spans up this big subcluster of networking stuff, but also you have another subcluster all the way up to the right there, and I'm just going to go over there and just zoom in a little so you can read it. So you have kernel NFSD SunRPC PC locked server down here, and SunRPC PC locked clients NFS up here. So these are very, very similar keywords, so it does make sense that they're put in the same subcluster up there. And you will just have to believe me when I tell you that these are the only two sections within the entire section graph that have any of these keywords. So not only are they put into the same subsystem, but in the same subcluster too. So this sort of makes sense, I guess. So this is the networking cluster. And I might be just showing you some perfect examples here where our clustering algorithm wields really sensible results. But let's take a look at some other clusters. Um, remember when I bothered you so much about the media subsystem earlier? Like, what's the media subsystem? Show it to me. Uh, there's your answer. This is it. This is, to be precise, this is the media and staging subsystem because subclustering shows that there's a clear media subcluster on here and a staging subcluster up there and a third um, subcluster down here, just Android drivers. We'll get to that in a second. And I wanted to know so much about the media subsystem and there it is. This is our media subsystem. So again, we have a very clear backbone section right here, media input infrastructure, which like spans up the entire um, subcluster and there's so much imagery name like going on webcam video 
virtual video driver, stuff like that. So this is very clearly the, um, the media subsystem, which contains a lot of media sections. And up here, we have apparently within the same subsystem, another subcluster that is entirely for staging. So there's this staging subsystem as the backbone, and there's so much staging going on here. And down here, we also have Android drivers as an own subcluster. So it apparently has something to do with staging, with the staging subsystem, enough to be put into the same subsystem, but not in the same subcluster. Uh, like it has something to do with staging, but not enough. So it is down here. And that's the media subsystem for now. And you will just have to believe me when I say we could spend hours, hours discussing these, uh, these sections in this graph, but you will have to believe me when I say that most of these major clusters and the minor clusters too have very, very clear themes going on. So I just assigned labels. This is the same section graph from before, but I just assigned labels to the clusters and of like which their ongoing themes within the subsystems are. So we had a look at networking and the media and staging subsystem down here. And we have so much more. We have SCSI, ARM, InfiniBand, USB networking drivers, which please note, networking drivers is an own cluster and shares a lot of edges with networking down here. So this does make sense if you think about it. And up here we have DRM drivers and sound and USB and stuff like that. We don't really have time to discuss all of them in details because we could spend hours discussing them. We already have, by the way, but like not here, but um, in our work, in our project. But um, subclustering is not always a good idea. Like I showed two very clear examples where subclustering is a good idea. Some of these are already standalone subsystems. One example would be the DRM drivers cluster, the DRM driver subsystem that we can see here. And again, we have a clear backbone section, DRM drivers, and lots of, lots of DRM drivers section here. So again, we have a very, very clear ongoing theme. And actually, I'm showing you this for a reason, because I want to talk about this cluster a little bit more. Just um, a quick review of what we saw just now, media subsystem and DRM drivers. And do remember when I told you to keep in mind that I was uh, analyzing and, and working on conforming patch integrations. So just a quick reminder, was a patch integrated by a relevant maintainer according to maintainers or the getmaintainer.pl script? If yes, this is a conforming integration. And I'm not going to go into much detail here because that's not the topic of this talk, but the basic idea is to analyze recent patch integrations and determine if they were done conformingly or not. And also, not just that, but we want to really have like have a look at any reasons for why patches might have been integrated unconformingly. And very, very, very important disclaimer at this point in time. So what we really want to do is to characterize and improve the development process and, and characterize patch integration. And to achieve that, we have to extract the current status analyze it, discuss it, characterize it. And if we, as soon as we really understand it, we can try to support and enhance it. But the first step is to still extract the current status and analyze it. What we do not mean to do under any circumstances is we do not mean to point fingers. We are not trying to call out any maintainers saying they did a bad job of unconforming patch integrations, trying to tell them how to do that job, like, blaming them or anything like that. This is not at all what we want to do. We just need to classify these patches in order to, um, to, to prove, like, prove the criteria and just get a basic idea what's going on. And classification like this in conforming and unconforming is necessary, but we're not trying to offend anyone here. This is not our goal. So with that in mind, we found something very interesting about this cluster. So um, there were some examples of unconforming patch integrations, and two of which were for sections within this subsystem. So we found one conforming unconforming integration for Intel DRM drivers up here, and the other one for Intel GVT minus G drivers all the way up down there. So 
we have some unconfirmed patch integrations, but we really want to know who actually are these maintainers that unconformingly integrated for these sections. So the maintainer who integrated for this section right here is a maintainer for this section right here, DRM drivers and missed GPU patches. And the maintainer who integrated unconformingly for this section is a maintainer for this section, DRM drivers. So note that not only do these sections share edges, so they are clearly thematically related, they are in the same subsystem. And the question now is, is it okay for, a, um, DR for DRM drivers maintainers to integrate within the DRM driver subsystem if we define that as a DRM driver subsystem? And at least for me, the obvious answer to that is yes, of course, obviously, like those are DRM drivers. And moreover, these are backbone, backbone sections, um, DRM drivers, maintainers. So this is like a very clear backbone section of the entire DRM drivers cluster. And this is as close as we currently get, at least in our work, to like really defining um, or clear cut defining the maintainers hierarchy. So you could argue that this is higher up in the maintainers hierarchy than this because this is a backbone section. But I'm just saying, these are DRM driver subsystems, um, DRM drivers, maintainers, integrating for DRM drivers, maintainers, and that's probably okay, which provides a very strong argumentation basis for um, safety critical certification criteria. So this is where it all goes full circle, and this is just so cool to notice. And moving on, let's just take a step back and and just take a look at what we what we achieved so far. So we have this definition for subsystems that we now applied and we have a visual representation of maintainers and we achieved a fully automated and mostly very sensible subsystem detection. So obviously there are misclassifications such as the nature of clustering algorithms and I can show you some of them too. Like I didn't just pull out perfect examples, I can show some of them too. There will be time for questions later and I can still show you some subclusters, uh, subsystems and stuff like that. And we also found a very, very strong argumentation basis for um, safety critical certifications. So that's really, really cool. Um, but believe me when I say we are barely scratching the surface here because there is so much more cool work to be done with this sort of project. So the obvious one that I've just discussed now is further combinations of subsystems and conforming patch integration. That's just what I just showed. But also, why cut down the, um, the, the cluster graph, uh, the, the, the section graph at all? So why, have, why not have cluster discussion on the full section graph? So why focus on the most influential ones when you could have the full section graph and see the full um, like subsystems and stuff like that. And wouldn't that be so cool? But also, why visualize the newest versions of the Linux kernel? Like, why not visualize earlier versions and have a sort of history of how subsystems developed and stuff like that? And furthermore, we had some first, um, like, uh, attempts of having an interactive graph. So the PDF files that I showed, they are very, very static and stuff like that. But if you can have a really integrate, like, interactive graph that also if you pour in some more work and some more explanations and some more documentation and stuff like that, you could have a um, interactive graph that like links to the actual Linux kernel repository. And again, if you pour in some more work, you could have, some, have an easier overview, especially for newcomers who are trying to get familiar with the um, Linux kernel repository. And also, the work that we do is not exclusive to the Linux kernel. There are other open source projects that use a sort of like maintainers file like approach to their development process. I'm just naming three here. And we already have the logic. Why not just try to apply it to them? And by far, the idea that I am most hyped about is why visualize sections? Wouldn't it be so cool, so cool to have a maintainers graph where you could like um, still analyze the maintainers file, but instead of analyzing and, and visualizing sections, you could visualize maintainers and thematical relations between maintainers and have sort of um, a detection for subsystems of maintainers or communities of maintainers. And it's gonna be a completely different graph. It's gonna like correlate maybe a little to it, but 
that would be so cool. And if you're interested in, at all in the work that we do, or how we did it, um, all work is integrated at github.com slash LFD, which stands for Laboratory for Digitalization slash Pasta, which is the patch deck analysis tool um, developed by Ralf Ramsauer. And just basically, this is it. If you have any questions, there is a 30 seconds delay, so maybe start typing them now. So much for listening and being interested in the work that we do. I am ready for anything that we, you would like to discuss now. So, yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Pia. Um, yes, we will be taking questions uh, just via the text chat. So if you could prefix your questions with question um, and we'll ask them as we see them. Mm -hmm. So I can maybe say something um, in the meantime. If you want to look at any of these clusters that I showed in the section graph, we could still have any cluster discussion or um, if you maybe later have any, any sort of questions, you could still contact me or um, any of my collaborators, uh, two of which are present today who could also write in chat. And we could still have cluster discussion after this talk or even like show you how to replicate all this data and all these graphs that I showed you today yourself. It's not that hard. And yeah, just, just for your information. Um, we have a question. Uh, from mm -hmm. Nick, it looks like yes. ARM was the node with the most edges. Any insights there? Yes. So, okay. Uh, ARM is by far the node with the most edges. That is indeed correct. And it's a very, very, very highly interconnected cluster. It, as it is inside, it's also outside. And the reason behind that is I hope you can read that. I did my best of having labels that do not intersect, but these, these are like very, very long labels. So the reason behind that is this cluster contains so many vertices, so many sections that share so, like within the entire section graph, they have very, very high degrees. And by far the one with the most degrees is open firmware flattened device tree bindings. Um, this is in here and there is so much ARM stuff going in here within this, this very, very big subcluster, which has like, I don't know, it just has a very, very high overall degree in the, um, the section graph, um, that's all I can say to that. I did not show, I, I, I am well aware that this is a very interesting cluster, but I did not show it because it's, it's very hard to read and it's very hard to look at, but I'm very glad that you're interested in it. So just, this is a subcluster down here um, with a lot of ARM stuff going on, which is apparently highly interconnected. And you also have one subcluster up here, which has a lot of pin control stuff going on. And um, another cluster down here, I can show them again in a second, that has like some sort of external stuff going on. And when I researched the degrees of the, the vertices inside of these clusters, I noticed that within this very, very big subcluster up here, there are lots of ARM sections which just have a very, very high degree. I don't know these sections. I haven't worked with any of them professionally, but that's just the nature of this very subsystem right here. So if that answers your question, um, yes, it's, it's just very highly connected and it's, it contains the highest degree vertex within the entire section graph, open firm and flattened device tree binding. So just on a quick side note and why I, I didn't really show this one specifically, but there is still this very, very clear theme going on in here. Um, of ARM pin controller and Samsung and Exynos. So just a bit, li little bit of information on this subsystem and, and these clusters, if that answers your question. Is that okay? Um, we've got another question from Uwe, yeah. yes. uh, who is asking, have you considered pruning some sections or clusters from your analysis? In many kernels, you don't configure a lot of the code. Um, so for security critical stuff, it might be useful to exclude staging, for example. Not yet. Um, we did not have any sorts of cutting down other than the cutting down on the most influential sections. So we did not pick any specific sections and just 
um, manually remove them other than the rest, okay? The rest is the most trivial and boring section because it shares every single file with every single section. So this was the only one that was specifically removed. But other than that, we did not. And we don't necessarily plan on doing that yet either. So if we push this work further to really verify s like certain criteria for the certifications, this might be the case because we are aware that not all subsystems are necessarily really, really interesting for uh, safety critical environments, but we're not doing that yet. So this is still just the very, very, very surface of the work that we're doing here. There's so much more to, to be gained or so much potential more. I don't know, it's just the very start of it all. So um, yeah, we, we are thinking about it though. If that answers the question, yeah? Uh, question, it seems like one of the easiest things to do useful with the data would be to look for likely out of date information in maintainers. Is that something you've considered? Um, slightly out of date. Um, so what you're saying is out of date um, sections and like misclassification and stuff like, okay, this should not belong in this subsystem, something like that. Did I understand that question? correctly uh yes looking looking for likely out of date information in maintainers hmm. information that might need updating in the list no okay so this sort of work really thrives from discussing it with um with the community so okay Quick disclaimer at this point. I know my section graph, right? I know my vertices. I know this thing like the back of my hand. I've had my share fair of working with this. But what I do not know are the singular sections, the singular vertices, uh, vertices because I haven't worked with any of these sections before. So what I really can't do at this specific point in time is really look at sections and already know them and know that this should not belong in there or this is outdated and this must be updated and stuff like that. That's not what um, we're, we're currently doing. But what we do want to do is show this data to the relevant maintainers and developers who actually work with these sections every day. And um, this sort of work really fries from that because if you do that, then you always have an up-to-date overview of how, how these subsystems actually look like that's still something we want to do so have like cluster discussion with the actual maintainers and the actual developers to sort of get this so this is still something we want to do because like i said this sort of work really thrives from showing it to the people that work with these sections every single day and yes that will be a consequence of, of, of doing that after all. So we do want to show that to them. And there will be some surprising structures of people thinking like, okay, this should not belong in there. Or this does actually surprise me that these things share thematic relations. So that's probably something to come. But we don't have anything yet in mind to automate that. Just having these subsystems and showing it to the developers and maintainers. So that's something to come. And... Yeah, so we'll probably have that. If I want to build a safety critical system, could I use your work to identify sections I could consider excluding? Okay, let me revise that. If I to consider sections to exclude, hmm. do we have anything from um, Wolfgang Maurer and Ralf Ramsauer in chat? Um, because I, I believe that, yes, like if you look at the data and how these regular relations are connected, but I have to admit, I'm not entirely sure. So you want to exclude sections for certain surgical conclusion. Well, what you really could find is, okay, I have these sections that are really important to me and you could find they are thematically related to other sections. So that's something you could notify and or like find out that they do not share any thematical relations with certain sections. So these could be like immediately excluded or you could find surprising thematical relations for other sections that you do then have to consider. So that's something you could use it for. Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. But yes, I do believe that this sort of work could be beneficial for that. Because like you could just see, okay, no edge is shared. This is just, you can just disregard all of these sections. So I, 
I think yes. I think yes. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, it looks like we've uh, um, finished with the questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Pia. And if you've got any further questions, um, ask them in the uh, BOF channel or uh, send them by email to Pia. Yes, um, please do. It's now lunch.